snow on the brain. The very first sighting was a fistful of specks, a flurry of confetti or ash. We call it snow on the brain, the doctor tells me, shrouding the truth in beauty and mystery and mesmerizing solace. He says it again, snow on the brain. But by now, I am drifting, drifting. Acceptance. The eye hides inside the skull's planet, buried deep like a seed or a stone. There is one vision, one hand to cast a shadow, one clearly defined line running along the lid of one woman's life, one single ramification. Below the eyes, a murky triangle of white has surfaced, a merciless reminder of the senses which have not yet petered out. Nose, mouth, tongue, a wedge of brilliant red marks the entrance to the triumphant throat. First MRI, thumbprint, bog, gully, cataract floating across the brain, prehistoric bloodstain, eye of the storm, shock wave, afterbirth, cross cut of an ancient oak, tail end of a reoccurring dream, blue-green swell writhing inside the body, halo, horizon, moat, an avalanche of inconceivable fear, irretrievable hope. Virus. A single thread escapes from outer space and finds its way into Marguerite's warm, lush body. Ecstatic with the comforts of home, he settles in and quickly learns the capacity to breathe. And without effort or thought, he begins to grow the semblance of limbs. One claw-shaped hand opened permanently like the mouth of a wrench. On the other side of what has become a plump, seal-shaped body is an almost human arm, an almost human hand, a wing about to flap for the very first time. From the body's center, another appendage sprouts, red-hot and obscenely defiant. A malformed phallus, perhaps, or the hard, mean butt-end of a gun. Even the thing itself, the renegade virus, does not understand the awkward appendage. He does not comprehend the malignant ache for violence which now occupies his once innocent body. He tries to recoil from this thing which has become him, but he cannot escape the swampy, halo of white which encompasses his entire being. All is not lost though, all is not devoid of hope, because the thing which was once a mere thread, an innocuous bit of nothing, has grown the most magnificent legs, hot pink and lobster orange, swirling into shapes only God himself could begin to imagine running freely, bending in ways nothing else has ever bent, sashaying to the ecstasy of this new found planet, this luxuriant abode, this sanctuary of 
Marguerite's majestic body. Vessels. Browsing through a book on Chinese pottery, I see the most captivating vessels, blood red and summer squash green, and my mind turns to the images of my brain taken by the MRI machine. What qualities do the brain and vessels share? Who can read the intricate, minute crazing that scars and maps their faces? What wells of wisdom and deprivation have they held? What love and art and magic potions churned inside their bellies? What dreams have brewed and bubbled over, forming random pools of light and chaos? Who will feel the need and own the passion to gather up the pieces and, without thought or apprehension, begin again? Two spines. Like the inner workings of a car, before MS, I took my spine for granted. Then one day, when I could still drive, when I could still walk wherever, whenever I damn well pleased, I found this rusty muffler in the gutter. I dragged it in its long, crooked pipe home to my garage. Here they are together two spines, one floating in air, the other leaning haphazardly against a chest of drawers, one stark naked, upright and proud, the other rigid with fear the rust inside its belly will spread and destroy the remaining semblance of stability and hope still holding it together. Crow, crow, peering in, looking on, perched precariously on a sea of white. Crow, the narcissist, reflecting all I have refused to admit I know. Crow, bearing witness to the darkest side, shamelessly gnawing at the core of my threadbare pride, flaunting his crow-black affiliation his utter addiction to all that is dead or dying. His hungry beak plucks me blind. Crow's incessant cawing threatens to puncture my meager peace of mind. For a moment, I imagined that my tasty morsel of a brain is locked inside a heavy globe of glass, like the star growth inside the paperweight that stares up at me from the corner of my desk. For a moment, I tie this thing called hope to the tail of a kite and watch it soar. For a moment, I envision Crow seething at the possibility of his own horrific journey, his own appalling demise. Crow waits patiently to feast on my soul. My guardian, you were there the day Achilles' mother held him by the heel and dipped him in the river. When Judas, by his own volition, kissed the lips of Jesus, and Buddha sat cross-legged beneath the ancient Bodhi tree. It is your face behind me in the mirror. Your eyes indulge me to see. Your tongue, though rich with silence, infuses mine with the sheer capacity of speech. Your shadow, though invisible to the naked eye, envelops mine. Your mellifluous snoring lulls me to sleep. You have always been careful not to cross the line. Your relentless, selfless dedication steadies the earth beneath my feet. You were there to catch me the day I escaped my mother's body. I felt your wings 
fold around me for the very first time. Trying to walk in what is blithely referred to as midlife, I'm expected to learn to walk again. But unlike the child who innocently discovers the magic wands inside her legs, I am a newly hatched robin being nudged from behind by a pitiless, impatient mother. Go ahead, she squats. I've had enough. My arms flap madly as I teeter on the edge. I feel my mother pushing me from behind each time I lose my balance. But unlike the willful toddler I imagine I once was, my feet are broken sticks. My legs are hollow stumps. My wings are snapped in half. Silent Journey Each day my gondola carries me a little further through the ancient floating city. Diazire, Diazila, Day of wrath, O oh day of mourning. Like the streets of Venice, I am disappearing, back into the water, back into the narrows, rushing past the rapacious swells of purgatory. Salvat se clomin favila. See fulfilled the prophet's warning. Then one day, as I am reading from my book of hours, the prow of my gondola slices through the Mediterranean blue waters. And I hear a voice say, There are no bones, there is no body. Teste David cum sabila. Heaven and earth in ashes burning. There are no words that can or will describe this silent journey. The twins. Each morning she wakes to the two of them, staring in silence from the foot of her wrought iron bed. She moans and shakes her head. She closes her eyes and tries with all her might to will the twins away. Run off and play, she clamors, knowing full well their interdependence is insatiable and complete. Even though she knows it is necessary to begrudge them, they are as much a part of her as are her arms and legs. Get out of bed, the twins demand. She grants herself one last sigh, then does as she is told. ask me why my face is painted green and why my eyes float downstream and what the thick red band across my brow is holding in or keeping out. They wonder why my mouth is painted silent white with a thin black line drawn across the center. And is my misshapen snout good enough for breathing? I tell them all they need to know is what they see and what their eyes invite them to imagine. These are the shoes. These are the shoes that went with the dress, that went with the shoes, that went with the dress. These are the shoes before the MS. Pink satin heels, shimmering with sequins, elegant emerald green, robin's egg blue, smooth, soft gray like the skin of a dolphin. She wore them stepping out with her husband, to the opera, to the theater, to the philharmonic, to a party, to a wedding, or to dinner. She wore them when she entertained by the warm candlelight of her own dining room. These are the shoes that adorned the feet that whisked her around the great cities of the world. Paris, London, Milan, Vienna, 
and Vancouver, that great city to the north where she wore her very first shoes. These are the shoes she wore with the dress, she wore with the shoes, she wore with the dress, before she knew. Silent scream. She wakes each morning, holding her breath, as if to dam the torrent of pain rising inside her left femur. She knows that, sooner or later, she will have no choice but to heed the scream she alone can hear. But for now, she lifts with her two good hands, one leg and then the other, to the edge of the bed. One by one, she lowers them down and starts over. Number 10331, five numbers define a life of a Jew, a patient, a side of beef. At the press of a button, number 10331 slides into the MRI machine. Hold your breath, the technician hollers from the other end. Do not move. Then, out of nowhere, a parade of invisible hammers marches in. They're insidious, tap, 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 echoes around and around the magnetic tunnel, nailing number 10331 to the cold, hard surface. Do not breathe, do not make a move, the voice repeats. Do not even think to yourself the names of your children or the name of your beloved husband who woke up one morning kissed you goodbye, then went to work and died. Breathe, the voice demands without emotion. Now hold your breath, hold, breathe, hold, breathe, as if God himself cannot make up his mind. Then. Just as you've grown accustomed to the rhythm of the ritual, the hammers halt and the technician blurts out, that's it, we're finished. As you slide back out on the moving shelf, like the kind you see in the movies in some subterranean city morgue, the technician, without the courtesy of eye contact, says, see, that wasn't so bad now, was it? ladder. I know now it does not matter what mask I wore as I was climbing up or down the ladder. It does not matter how high I climbed or what weight I bore upon my shoulders. That's all past. Now there are only fine hewn rungs held together by this life we are bound to suffer and transcend. There are only hands and feet doing what they do best. Grasp.